U.S. military planners prepare to support a multinational African force to intervene in northern Mali in an attempt to roll back al-Qaeda in the region. And U.S. Senate Republicans reject a U.N. treaty on the rights of the disabled, even though it was based on existing U.S. law. What does that vote tell us about the current political atmosphere? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansi. Pentagon officials are working with African nations ahead of possible international military action against al-Qaeda-linked groups in northern Mali. The Obama administration, however, says U.S. involvement will be limited to helping with military planning, working alongside partners in ECOWAS, the 15-member economic community of West African states and the African Union. There has been growing international concern over Mali's north, an area the size of Texas, which was taken by Islamic fighters following a coup in Mali earlier this year. Those fighters are also said to have close links with the Boko Haram sect, which has been blamed for violence in Nigeria. Earlier this week, however, the top U.S. commander in Africa warned against premature military action. Army General Carter Ham said that an immediate intervention would be likely to fail, and set back the situation even further. So is a military intervention necessary in northern Mali? With me to discuss this is independent Africa policy analyst Nia Quetta, who testified at the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, uh, hearing about possible intervention on Wednesday. And from New York, Paul Mutter, an international affairs analyst and fellow at truthout.org. Ni, nee, first of all then, perhaps um, we can just run through exactly what you are asking for at the Senate uh, on Wednesday. Certainly. What I'm asking for is that the State Department position needs to evolve more because it seems to me that they are, despite the rhetoric, they are not taking the situation seriously enough. The key to that is that the, when Mali lost the, the northern two-thirds, more than 60 percent, the size of Texas, as you said, it's been seven months. And what we, I don't think, has been reported enough, but Human Rights Watch reports it brilliantly, is the, the chaos and the brutality and the pushing out of Malians there. To me, it's Mali seems to be on fire. So it's seven months of letting a fire burn. And the U.S., I think, and the international community needs to give moral and legal and technical support to the Africans so that they can end that fire. And the other thing is that I think it's also a matter of sovereignty and respecting African opinions and what they want to do. Um, the Africa Union, ECOWAS, they have all said, this is what we want to do. Um, Malians want this. They march on the street. Now, truth be told, there are some Malians who are protesting, but we know they are linked with Sanogo, who made the coup, and who doesn't want a real serious force in because that's his, right, his but, area. But some might argue that you're asking for two contradictory things here. You're arguing for the sovereignty of African nations, but you're also asking for U.S. intervention. What is, what well, is it's, it's never U.S. intervention. I'm the first to say no U.S. intervention, no U.S. Uh, boots on the ground. But to be, to be realistic, the Africans need help, and they also need, they don't want to do it illegally. So they want the UN to say, look, this is, uh, this is within international law. But they do need support. If, I think a good analogy is during the Second World War, Roosevelt was saying, look, if your neighbor's house is on fire and the fire is coming to you and you have a good water hose, it makes sense to give it to your host. All right, I, mean, well, I mean your neighbor. Before I bring Paul in, just one last question. Sure. What would the goal of this intervention be? Would it be a clear, I mean, is there a clear goal you're setting out? Yes, the, the goal, and nobody is saying, I won't use the word easy. It, it's going to be difficult, but it's the least bad of the options. But the goal is to eject the terrorists who are brutalizing northern Mali and causing chaos. And it's in Western interest because they are aiming. Mali is not their first uh, uh, target, actually. They are aiming for France and for the United States. So it's a matter of let's deal with it before it gets much worse. Paul Mata, what do you make of that argument? Um, the key for any military intervention, um, which would be ECOWAS and African Union-led, not U.S.-led, 
Um, the U.S. has, as we heard General Ham has said, the U.S. does not have plans to do that. Um, U.S. assets in Mali have more or less been shut down because of the coup. Um, we had two aid programs there. Uh, one was state, one was Pentagon. Um, they both focused on counterterrorism, actually, more than development or anything else. Um, and look what ended up happening in the north. The Malian army was driven out, and now the coup. And so far, Mali gets some humanitarian aid, but that's it. Um, those programs have never seemed to have been evaluated independently too much, so I, I can't speak on them. But they're kind of a highlight of something Ni mentioned about just the development focus not being there. Because if we look at the north, we have the MNLA that came in from Libya with the, the weapons it got from Gaddafi's disintegrating state. And then Ansar, Ansar Dean, excuse me, was um, with them at the time. And now it's the predominant player. It's in talks with the government, too, through Burkina Faso. It and the MNLA are talking. Um, so, I mean, just, and we'll just have to, to see where those further go. clarify that a bit, then. So the, the, the Tuaregs uh, and, and a sort of a, a more extreme ex Islamic group kind of joined forces in some ways, then, in, in, in the north. And then the Islamic yes. forces got the upper hand. Yes, right. and Sardine is explicitly Islamist, the MNLA is not. Right. And what, what impact do you think uh, international intervention will have on this situation? Paul. The, the, main, the main concern there again is that the e intervention by ECOWAS does not escalate the conflict in northern Mali because just the caution we saw with the MLA drove into Timbuktu and Gao was it immediately became extremely unpopular because of all of the atrocities it was documented as committing. Um, the Human Rights Watch had noted that when it first came in there were a lot of complaints and the Islamist groups, uh, one of which is not Tuareg, it's um, mostly Arab tribes from the region I think, they had come together and they were leading street protests against the MNLA and the MLA got, has been kicked out of most of these cities now and the Islamists are imposing their own legal structure and warning against any foreign intervention. The only one that is negotiating with the government is in Sardine and they kind of hold all the cards but it's not clear what their agenda is because it's partly a vehicle for Agali's own aspirations of leadership, right. but it also is, it wants to Islamicize all of Mali right now, actually. That's what they're saying. I mean, the problem neither is we've been here before and we've seen what intervention has done. Not only does it tend to spur rebellion, spur recruitment for Al-Qaeda, uh, beyond the further mm -hmm. bloodshed that might uh, be caused, uh, this might create a refugee crisis that will destabilize all the countries in the region and indeed if successful even, might push Al-Qaeda into Algeria, into these other, into these other countries. Um, and shouldn't there be some pause, especially given that this crisis was created by a Western intervention in Libya? Um, I think, um, it, number one, the fact that it was, uh, it was triggered by Libya is important, and I'm glad you mentioned it and Paul mentioned it, because it gets left out. The coup didn't trigger it. Libya triggered it. That's important. But all the other terrible consequences that might happen that, that you mentioned, and I agree with them, the only thing is I flip them around. All of them are going on right now. So when you say no intervention, the question is, so if we don't let the Africans, and you know, people hear intervention, they are thinking Western intervention. I say no, 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 no. The Africans say, our houses are on fire, we want to take care of it, but we need your help to do it legally. All the things you are mentioning are already happening. So when you say no intervention, what is left? You are saying just let it happen. Uh, half a million, almost half a million Malians have been pushed out. And in fact, my concern, people ask me, what are you for? What is driving you? And I'm saying concern about African suffering drives me more than ideology. And you see no scope at all for a negotiated settlement? Oh, I do. I do see negotiated settlement. In fact, the, the first, we've had talks about talks. Then just this week, the government and um, uh, Ansardine uh, had talks, and, and MNLA had three-part talks in Burkina Faso. I'm glad it's going on, but two things about that. I think it's actually, if you get serious about the intervention, because frankly, I see the groups in Northern Mali as more or less bullies. They will talk only when they think they can't get away. If they think you are weak, they push you around, number one. Number two, uh, also frankly, I don't trust them. Whatever they agree to, we don't know. So if they, they can say anything, and then if they think the world's attention is turned away, they go back to doing what right. they did.
So, Paul, I mean, does that convince you? And this is all partly leverage, actually, to get a negotiated settlement. I think so. Um, there have been reports from Mali, from uh, journalists I know in the region, saying that these Islamist groups have been falling over themselves helter-skelter at the prospect of a military intervention. They don't have, I mean, they did defeat the Malian army, but the Malian army is small, and now that there's the possibility of a bigger intervention, they are very concerned. However, there is one thing I would like to just, maybe, maybe a bit devil's advocate here, but with the intervention, the thing to remember is that you brought up about how going in there risks spreading the conflagration over the region. Now, it is definitely true that there already is a refugee crisis. Mo there's a couple hundred thousand Malians internally displaced. There's hundreds of thousands more uh, throughout the region. Yes. But an intervention that drives these groups closer and has to be careful to anything that's done with the diplomacy and the talks, and I think that's why the talks are important, because if you can pull Ansar Adin and the MNLA away from AQIM, which is actually, essentially it's a, um, a former Salafist group from Algeria yes. that formed right after their civil war concluded. It didn't want to do any national reconciliation stuff. But in terms of operationally, we're looking at maybe 500 to 1,000 fighters. So with the intervention, you have, to, you have to be careful not to spread these people around the region because they will go back to Algeria, they will go into Libya again, they will continue pestering Mauritania. And another issue with Mali, and this is two points about the army that I, I just want to, to raise here, maybe Nick can discuss them, because I want to talk about the capacity of the Malian army since it will We've only got a couple of, of minutes left, Paul, so you have to be quick. Oh, okay. All right. So the first thing is that AQIM reportedly has been using, bribing people within the Malian army up until um, well through this point from the early 2000s on. And the other thing is when the Malian army has gone into the north to fight Tuareg separatists before in the 1990s, in 2006, in 2008, um, the issues have been that it's been accused of human rights violations in and of itself, and that alienates people, and that drives them into the and, arms and of me, the I mean, extremists. You're well aware of all these problems. I, I am, and, I, and, and I am. the one thing to say is if there is um, going to be intervention, it has to be very well planned. You will, it yeah, has to, we heard that and, before then. Yes, and it has, you have to train. I, I mean, I said it in my, in my Senate testimony. The training that African soldiers need is first and foremost respect for civilian authority, but, second, but, human rights. But it's notable that the Can Malian army yes. has been the uh, benefactor, or the beneficiary rather, of millions of dollars of U.S. training and aid since 2002. And I, it, at the first hint mm -hmm. of rebellion, they all I, ran away and left their arms behind. I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, yesterday, the assistant secretary from the Defense Department was pressed on that. And she said, well, we have to admit that because the Trans-Sahara counterterrorism program that mm -hmm. has not worked. I've criticized it in writing. It right. needs to be reviewed. So it's a matter of this time uh, we have to make sure we do it right because the, the alternative... US, does the U.S. even understand the region? You're asking for U.S. help and of course the U.S. will view it through simply the prism of the war on terror. And that's exactly. why I'm asking what the goal is of this. Of well, this actually, well. You, you've got the Europeans. The Europeans actually are more involved. The French, the Germans, Prodi, and Italian is the special uh, representative of the UN. So this is not really a U.S. dominated. And you trust the Europeans? Um, not really. No, I don't. I don't, but they are scared that, that if this is not dealt with, it's coming to bite them, which is why I think we should respect the Africans and look at what they are doing and give them support where they need it. But this should be under complete African control, because if you don't, you are saying, let, let the Africans be killed, let them die, let the, and, and the contagion, the fact that if we intervene, it will spread to other regions. In fact, that's the reason to, because it is already spreading. We have had people moving from Pakistan and Afghanistan and Somalia and Nigeria. So actually, we have to understand what is going on now. The Africans are saying we have to put a stop to it because it will only get worse. So it's not intervention that will make it worse. It is what is going on now. Very quickly, Paul. Is, your, mm -hmm. is the argument then perhaps though, that given the U.S.'s track record in intervention, given the track record generally of this sort of intervention, that it's never advisable? Could you, could you see a, a case where it is, it is possible that it won't do, won't do more harm than good? No, there really is no case where it wouldn't do more harm than good, but we're talking a choice of evils at this point. Um, for Mali's integrity and for the people of Mali, 
leaving the area alone is not an option. They would like, I mean, now we have a half a million refugee crisis on our hands. But I would just think going in with this, we have two years until it's even supposed to happen. And in the meantime, Mali is supposed to have democratic elections next April. Um, I, I think we're, we're getting, the international community, excuse me, is getting a little too caught up in the prospect of what they will do on the ground in two years with ECOWAS, of course, carrying it out. I, I don't think there's the focus on, well, how do we, while well, we're treating the patient, how do we keep the contagion from spreading all over the operating table? 10 seconds. Please. Yes, I think the key is listen to what the Africans are saying. The Africa Union, President uh, uh, Yai of Benin, President Ouattara of Cote d'Ivoire, they have all said, yes, we are concerned, yes, we will talk. But the Algerians first, don't seem so keen. But Yes, uh, because no, AQM came from Algeria, right. and Algeria don't want AQM coming back for, right. into Algeria, but even they understand, reluctantly, they've agreed. But Algeria is one country, okay. everyone it's else. The, but it's the regional powers, so it's one of the most important ones here. All right, well, we've got to end it there. But thank, thank you so much, Paul Mutter, Nia Quetta, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This week, the U.S. Senate failed to ratify a United Nations treaty that aims to set an international standard on the rights of disabled people. The 38 no votes, all from Republican senators, were cast even though the treaty is based on existing U.S. legislation. It was negotiated under Republican President George W. Bush and backed by Republican grandees such as Bob Dole and John McCain. It has been signed in 155 countries and ratified in 126, including Britain, France, China and Russia. But the Republican right argued it impinged on U.S. sovereignty. For example, opponents said it would take away parents' rights to homeschool disabled children. Some even argued it might lead to the forced sterilization of the disabled. Democratic Senator John Kerry called it one of the saddest days in his 28-year Senate career. And it's led to questions as to whether President Obama's proposal for a bipartisan grand bargain with Republicans is advisable if they continue to cling on to extreme right-wing orthodoxy. So what does the Senate disabilities vote say about U.S. politics? With me is Eric Rosenthal, executive director of Disability Rights International. And from New York, Alex Kane, world editor with Alternet.org. Eric Rosenthal, first of all, what did you make of the sort of objections we were hearing to the ratification of well, this convention? Well, you know, we in the disability community were outraged that this could become a partisan issue. Disability rights has always been bipartisan in the United States. Uh, this convention is consistent with American law, lessons learned from our own movement and an opportunity for the United States to take a stand on a broad international issue that uh, people with disabilities care about. So right. it was but terribly about, disappointing. What about this issue of sovereignty, that, that homeschooling might be threatened, or indeed uh, that uh, disabled people might be forced to You know, to the homeschooling issue, the sterilization issue, really red herrings. Uh, it, I think what it comes down to is uh, partisan politics and a broad antipathy towards uh, the United Nations on the part of a, a right wing of the Republican Party. But, I mean, given that it isn't legally binding, um, I mean, what, what would have been the significance of ratifying it? Well, again, as someone who has spent 20 years fighting against very serious abuses that exist worldwide, we want our government to take a strong stand on these issues. Um, and our credibility is at stake. If we're not willing to hold ourselves to the same standards that we hold the rest of the world, how can the United States speak out on this issue? So our community wants action on this around the world. I mean, much of the discussion, though, does emphasize that, you know, this is in part, in part based on the Americans with Disabilities absolutely, Act. You know, absolutely. The, the trailblazer, I hear yep. the term gold standard. Right. But uh, there's still a lot to do, though, in the right. U.S., isn't there? Well, or? overall, we're very proud of what we've accomplished in the United States, and that's why international scrutiny, open the doors, let the light in, take a look at what we're doing. Of course, we're not perfect. We've got a long way to go in a lot of areas, but our laws are pretty good. We're proud of them. All right. Well, Alex Kane, then. Help us make sense of all this. Um, I, I suppose, I mean, are the origins, I and mean, before we get on to the, the current bipartisan splits and, and so forth, or the partisan splits, is this about the UN? Yeah, I mean, the United Nations and American politics has uh, been an important issue for some on the right. For example, you had the John Birch Society, which was a 1950s era, staunchly anti-communist uh, conservative movement and one of their big planks is to get the US out of the UN and this is a, a society that is infused with conspiracy theories 
And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, conspiracy thinking on the right about the United Nations. You know, um, this notion that the UN is bent on uh, taking over the world and taking over the American government to institute, well, as the John Birch Society would say, uh, a one, you know, one world government that is socialist. Um, you know, obviously this is ridiculous, but there's a long history on the right of this type of thinking. And recently, much of this based on Agenda 21, the kind of the, 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 the plan for some sustainable development, basically. Right. That was uh, Glenn Beck, former Fox News star, now a radio host. That was one of his pet issues um, last year in, in 2011. Agenda 21 is this non-binding, sustainable vision that uh, many countries, part of the UN, ratified. And it's really a vision for sustainable living in the future. Um, I mean, there's no real enforcement mechanism, but Glenn Beck uh, looked at this, and also other uh, right-wing media stars looked at this and saw a, real, a plot a conspiracy to impose uh, the United Nations socialist um, agenda on the United States. And of course, you know, uh, this is it's very similar to the John Birch Society and right. other right wing conspiracies uh, that, you know, it, 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 there's a straight line. The, the point is there that, I mean, how prevalent are these thoughts? Because I mean, Glenn Beck, who we mentioned, I mean, he's, he's got a best selling novel right now on the New York Times bestseller list based on this theory. For sure. Uh, I think a significant part of the Republican base is um, with this sort of anti-United Nations sentiment. And um, it's not insignificant on the part of the Republican base, on the part of uh, people associated with the Tea Party. The other thing to remember, though, is the vast majority of Americans actually believe in the United Nations. A poll last year uh, s said that about 60 plus percent of Americans wanted uh, the United States to be a part of the UN and to make our annual dues to the United Nations and so on. So um, while a significant chunk of the Republican base is certainly totally against the United Nations and totally against the United Nations for bogus reasons, um, that flies in the face of the larger American people's will on this issue. And, and the Republican Party was split on this. I mean, it's important to recognize that we only came four votes short. Right, but 38 voted 38 against. voted against and only it. only eight. Uh, but but we, we needed only four more right. votes. Uh, there were a couple uh, senators who were swing votes right to the very end. There was a last minute campaign. So we're glad that we've got McCain's support, Barrasso, some, some people who you wouldn't expect necessarily to be um, pro-United Nations in this area. And we feel that if we could get another crack at it, we got a chance to turn this around. The people with disabilities in the United States, once they start feeling the pressure, there's been incredible outrage since this vote. And those senators are feeling the pressure and I think what we're going to see, the fact that we've got a split Republican Party, those senators are, are, have to look at the electorate. And as you right. said... But, but, but Alex, as we look forward to all the, all the legislative battles ahead, I mean, is this because these senators really do believe the UN is you know, a font of conspiracies? Or is it because the, 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 the fear of a right-wing primary challenge is still so great that you're not really going to get much compromise or, 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 or even, um, even policy advocated that has any roots in the truth or science or economics? Well, I think it's both. Uh, you saw senators in the Senate during this debate um, make the case that this would undermine American sovereignty, that it would uh, damage homeschooling in the United States. There are senators, um, many of them affiliated again with the Tea Party movement, that actually believe in many of these theories. Um, but yeah, I think you're right on, on, on the, your other point in, in that um, other sort of more moderate Republicans may have thought to themselves, you know, I don't want to vote for this because I can just see attack ads, right wing attack ads from uh, Tea Party groups going after me for you know voting for uh, undermining American sovereignty. You know that would be the message from ads or or primary like, primary challenges like that. So I do think it's both, and I think both of them play played a role in why this was scuttled. And the other thing is, you know, there was a majority that voted for this, but because of the Constitution, you need a two thirds uh, majority to to ratify any of the treaties. So. You know, it, it, it'll be a tough battle ahead, but I think. But what about, Alex, I mean, this whole concept then of bipartisan compromise being a good thing if one is negotiating with people who have no interest in, you know, in, for example, you know, the economic health of the nation. They're, they're, they've, got other, they've got other agendas going on. I mean, on the, the budget issue, there's probably more of a need to compromise. But again, I mean, I think principles should come first uh, on budgets or on 
uh, disabilities, you know, we should be talking about rights, we should be talking about the poor in this country, you know, on the, on the budget issue, they're going to be hit hard by any compromise because of the, when Republicans talk about compromise, they're really talking about, uh, well, on budget issues, you know, um, raising taxes on the middle class and the lower class and, and cutting them for the rich. So, you know, there, there, there should be a question of, of should we be compromising with uh, extreme right-wing uh, politicians? Alex Wayne, thank you very much. Eric Rosenthal, thank you. And that's it from the team in Washington, D.C. for now.